Welcome guys to the official pre-dotyping podcast where we basically talk about everything to do with pre-dotyping. And so in this season, you will learn about different aspects of the methodology, hear from different pre-dotyping practitioners, and even see us try to make our own, all in the spirit of validating your idea with your own data. I'm Jonathan Sun. And I'm Robert Scrub. On our show today are two guests. The first one is the founder of Visualize Solutions, providing holistic startup coaching and helping business teams scale and make an impact. He is a certified Lean Stack coach and works closely with Ash Moria. The second is the founder of SK Innovations, which focuses on designing user-centric products. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome Andrew Constable and Saibo Kaiba. How are both of you guys doing today? We're good. How are you guys? I'm good, I should say. <laughs> yeah, good, thanks. How are you? I'm, uh, I'm chilling. I'm chilling. Um, we were just talking about, um, we were just talking about lockdown stuff um, earlier, but, uh, but let's jump straight into it. Um, Andrew and Saibo, tell me about how you guys got into prototyping. Um, I'll, be, I'll be honest, it was something I, I, I'd read, I'd read some pieces about it last year. Um, and it was really, to be honest, it was really Rob. Rob Scrober actually got me really interested in it because I was on the uh, global virtual design sprint with, with Rob and um, really on the back of that, although I've read a lot of the, the work around it, I hadn't really in, in, engaged in the content, particularly massively. I understood what the different, pr different principles were, but it was actually getting involved with Rob and Rob actually going through it for the first time for me was like, okay, this is sort of a bit of a light bulb moment for me. Um, and I think that's when I really started really investing in it and really trying to get, you know, some knowledge around it and integrate it with my other practices, which is what, you know, how, how I've done it. And you got involved right around the time where we were just starting to experiment with it. Cause at that point we were thinking about how design sprints can basically go beyond just the compartmentalized four or five days and actually have some real traction. Prototyping offered the possibility of testing out what we were thinking, or instead of doing interviews, really taking the ideas from the team and testing them in the market. So you were part of that initial group, core group that were like, okay, where can we take this? So, yeah. Exactly. exactly. I think for me, it was like straight away, it was, it was a light bulb moment. It was, it was the piece which I felt was missing from certain other practices where it just, and I think you had the same thoughts, Rob, didn't you? When you came across it, it was just something which, Straight away, I thought, okay, this is this is very nice just to implement into something else I do, and it works really well. So, this was the cheese that was needed on the pizza, if you want to make an analogy. <laughs> then definitely, Italian analogy after Roberto. There you go. Yep. <laughs> so, what about you? So, um, I, I want to say your name properly, Cybelle, correct? Yep. Perfect. Perfect. Um, okay. I think I came across uh, prototyping from. YouTube searching. I've just been in the industry or the landscape of like innovation, entrepreneurship for a very, very long time. And I was really reaching the point where I was, I was given up because um, I, so there's two things that I practice. One is I have clients that I help bring their ideas into market and help them develop th their ideas, et cetera, et cetera. And then I myself try to work on my own ideas and my startups. And I think I was just reaching the point where I felt like I, I was following all the rules, all the advice. I've been to so many um, what you, incubators and so many workshops, but I just felt like I wasn't succeeding and I was spending too much money. I was watching clients, like individual clients, not big companies, individuals spend lots of money, put their house up, take out loans to um, support an idea that they truly believe in. So I was, I was just at the verge of kind of just transitioning from all of that. And then just from Googling, I think YouTubing, I'm not sure what I YouTube, but I definitely, something around the lines of um, uh, validating an idea, something along those lines. And then I came across Alberto's video. And I think that night I just uh, binge watched all his videos back to back. I emailed him right away. And, and like you said, Andrew, I knew right away that this was some, the missing piece that I needed to go forward in my career and help other people. Uh, yeah, and that's another thing which got me really interested was the videos, like you mentioned. You know, the videos when Alberto, he didn't do them until a bit later on after I got involved in it, but okay. I, 
for me, it was the videos were another icing on the cake because for yes. me it was, it was, you know, I think I'm a closet geek really when it comes to data and understanding. Right. And when Alberto was going through the videos and he was breaking down and wanting to play in English and one using the very, you know, the high level mathematics or yes. the high level, I, I really liked the, the more manual process of working it out compared to just using a finger in the air. Um, <laughs> and so maybe I am a classic geek and I didn't know. That. <laughs> well, interesting, like I'm not coming from a math or data perspective, but how he was explaining it and connecting it to innovation and prototype, it clicked for me. Like mm -hmm. technically speaking, I'm still learning the data and the numbers and just really trying to grip that but I know it makes sense, if that makes any sense. I don't have the high level skills, but I conceptually know that this makes sense and it adds up to something. So I really, the videos and how he explained it really, I knew that this was the missing piece. It's crazy, uh, Saibo, like kind of like when you were mentioning about like people taking out loans, you know, like most people taking out like loans to start their business. I remember the very first, I think, um, mentor meeting that I ever got invited to, I was in university. And, um, and one of the guys, you know, he started like this, he, he almost, he built a sort of like Kazai Crunchbase competitor uh, around in Seattle. And then like, you know, when he talked about his success story, like it, it was not the prototyping approach at all, but like what right. he was talking, what he talked about was like how, like at the brink of his business, like he took out, like he did the whole take out ridiculous loans and like do all that stuff. He said, if he didn't get his, he, if he didn't get funding the next day, he was going to get kicked out of his house. He would have been homeless. He went that level of extreme. Yeah. Oh, and like, sorry. people don't need to do that stuff. Exactly, exactly. And I totally agree. And that's, um, aside from like the technical skills, that's one of the things I really appreciate about prototyping is bringing um, Zen, calmness, sense <laughs> to um, this, <clears throat> this landscape. I, I myself, for example, um, have done things where people, you know, trust me in the sense of like, like, you know, I was on the dragons then I mentioned to you and I look back at how much money I've spent on things and have these titles associated with these things. And it, it, and it was a lot of pain, you know, that sometimes people hear the titles, they hear the achievements, but you don't know how to tell them, like, I don't think I would ever do this again. You know, <laughs> you know, they're celebrating, but you deep down inside and said, I, I put a lot of people through a lot. Like there's a lot of emotional psychological things that as we all know that comes with this journey and having something like prototyping to reduce that is something that at the very least people should do as a holistic way of practicing and um everything you just said i've worked with people where the couple is breaking up because the wife doesn't want to spend twenty thousand dollars on developing this idea the husband feels like she like so many things so and i felt like um a lot of this stuff could be resolved with prototyping. So I, I definitely think it's something that the industry needs on so many different levels. Mm, absolutely. Um, I got I to gotta, I gotta shift the conversation because, Saibo, I remember that you posted on, um, on the Slack channel about the face mask disinfecting home unit prototype you made yes, and yes. you posted a video. Tell us yes. about like the process, you, uh, you, the process that went into like building out that prototype and like how it's going for you so far. Okay, cool. So like basically ever since being in the Slack group, um, certified and just learning about prototype and I just been experimenting, um, having fun, really trying to play around with the ideas and I'm very precise. So I like to practice things and then figure out precisely what's happening. So with the um, face mask, um, I wanted to follow the 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 like what they use for the palm pilot i think it's pinocchio i want to follow that just to the teeth play around with myself get a, a good feel for how that flow works so i created that it's actually hung up over there and it, what it's meant to do is um i was thinking like I, I like my mask to be disinfected on a regular basis and um i find that like between me and my son we just throw it in our pockets when we're outside it it's, has it's germy and if we're, if it's not wash week, I don't want to wash, use the laundry to wash one face mask. So that was the thinking behind it. So I built a prototype, which is a shoe box and it's meant to play as, um, as a disinfective machine. And what I've been doing for the last week is every time that I go out and wear my face mask, I mark that I wore it today and it goes back into the machine, the, uh, the sterilizing machine. 
And when I feel like I want to disinfect, I press the button, <laughs> you know? So what it's doing for me is it's giving me kind of like the Palm Pilot feel. Am I really going to use this? How many times have I come into contact with it? How many times have I touched it? How many times have I felt like I want to use it and that I actually used it? So it's going pretty good, actually. <laughs> so have you fulfilled your XYZ hypothesis? So my XYZ hypo- hypothesis ends on Thursday. So far, I won't get up to go do it, but so far I think I've been out because I do take daily walks. I've been out maybe five times and I've tried to use it three times to clean it. So, so far it seems like something that I personally would use. So, so far it looks like I'm fulfilling it. I'm excited to hear, uh, to, to, to see your continued updates with it. I think it's a cool device, uh, but, you. but that being said, um, data always beats opinion. Exactly. And so I think always... that that's, that's the goal I want to, um, I like the idea too, but I want to also put into practice just the little things, especially with prototyping. What I also like about it is it's very precise behavior data calculating. So in designing this, um, not only the device, but keeping things like, where is it located in the house? Where is it that I'm gonna be using it? Is it in a proper position? So prototyping, especially when you're practicing, is not just um, making the most minimal like version of your product, but it's also the positioning. Are you um, putting it in the right you know, place? Is it positioned properly so that it's convenient? All of those things. So the idea is good, it's fun, but I'm also, giving myself a chance to practice how like the other key um, variables affect prototyping. Absolutely. Um, and then now what's uh, slightly shift the conversation over to Andrew, because Andrew actually has done something really unique where he's fused kind of like the prototyping methodology into, um, into a sort of like business coaching slash innovation consultancy. Andrew, tell us how you've managed to fuse prototyping and business coaching together. And like, how's that process been for you so far? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it was really helped. Um, I think when I was working, when I did the, um, on the Slack channel and I was, I was working on the, the, the course, the program, um, it was quite, it was quite good actually, because part of that course was integrating the prototyping method with the lean canvas. Uh, which is a, a tool I use all the time, you know, and because I'm a, a lean stack coach um, and Ash Mora, who's my coach is obviously the, um, he's the guy who came up with that canvas. It kind of makes a lot of sense to sort of integrate it. And it's something I've been doing for quite a long time. Um, so how I tend to use it, I use prototyping is I call it just high level or high impact validation. I call it. And the re- the way I tend to do it is, I will, again, use it at the early stages, as we all do with prototyping. I will use it at the desirability stage of the business, test the idea. And how I've actually, how I've actually managed to get a lot of success, well, quite a lot of success in my view of this is um, we use it in Lean Startup as a, as a technique called judo strategy, um, which some people may have heard of, some people may not have heard of. And, the premise behind it is, is normally with startups, what you tend to do is you slow them down because startups try to go too quick and they try to do things in the wrong order, the wrong time. So that's what we tend to do. But if we find that a startup is really a kind of in a position where they are um, not really, maybe the mindset is still not shifted to slowing down. They want to still go 150 mile an hour. What we tend to do is use a judo strategy on them and what that is in judo you might know judo in judo you use leverage to throw your own personal leverage to throw exactly so what we tend to do we use their own momentum against them and the way we do that is if they come to us and say you know we we've got this idea we want to test it and we'll say okay follow these steps do x y and z and they still don't don't want to do it we'll say okay great well, what we're going to do, we're going to prototype this. Now, it could be simple. It could just be a simple landing page. It could be a YouTube video. It could be anything like that. And we'll put it out there and we'll test it. And then we'll use some data behind that and we'll work out how what it looks like. Now, you have to take into consideration other things like channels and all that. 
But as long as you button down the different channels to get traffic to say a landing page, as an example, what, what I've actually found is because what I've actually found is one of the important things with any entrepreneur, any, any business really, is that you can't just tell people how to do something. Generally, they won't listen. They, they, it takes a certain amount of time for someone to actually go into the mind or you have to show them. And that's where pre attacking has been really helpful for me because, you know, I won't name names, but I had an example recently of, a, of an idea where someone thought, you know, it was a fantastic idea. They were going to invest thousands and thousands of pounds in this idea. And we literally put it out there. We got the messaging, we think, quite right. We got on a landing page. We got some various other things. We set the difference, test up, experiment. The conversion rate after driving over a thousand pounds worth. Of, this is quite an expensive prototype, by the way. This is high hybrid, um, but we we drove a lot of traffic to this landing page, and the conversion rate was literally 0.75 percent. Now, to me, that you know, for me, I felt okay, okay. So that is exactly validated, exactly what we were saying to the person who was going to spend thousands of pounds on their project. They actually had a light bulb moment. Okay, fantastic. Okay, now it's cost us a bit of money, but it's not cost us half as much as it would if we quit our jobs and we hired a salesperson to go out there and sell it. And um, and that client is 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 still working with me. You know, they're still working with us now, and we're on the project and we're working with it. And it integrates, and that's integrating it with the lean startup method or the lean 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 start method method. What I actually work with. Oops. Could I um, make a comment, Andrew? Yeah. Yeah, which um, some of the things you said really stood out to me and very relatable. And one of the things you said about entrepreneurs having the speed, go fast mentality is something that also I've seen a lot. And I think the current um, language of innovation, entrepreneurship contributes to a lot of how we go about testing ideas. It's speed, hurry up, the first, someone is going to steal it, all of this energy and psychology around like just move fast someone's going to steal your idea hurry 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 up and um i never heard of the judo strategy but that's something i definitely want to learn more about but um identifying that and something so far i'm seeing that prototyping is slowing that that down and for clients that i've spoken to so far about prototyping that is their concern well if i do it this slow someone's going to steal the idea and this is taking too long and there's a lot of um, that whole concept of speed and having to move fast and fail fast and fail fast and wrong and hurry up is, is one of the key things that um, what, what is, a, is affecting people understanding how prototype works because they're scared that if they move too slow, they're not going to um, succeed. Yeah, and I think, I think, you know, on that, I think, you know, you said about people, you know, potentially stealing ideas. Well, I think Alberto makes reference quite a lot in his text and his work, you know, a Kickstarter, for example, the Kickstarter programs are, are too far down the line. They way after, way after a prototype generally. Right. And a lot of people, a lot of people have this impression or this mindset or this bias in their mind that they have a great, they think it's a great idea. And I'm not, you know, I, I always say to my people I coach, I, I, I can't say if it's a great, a good idea or a bad idea. Right. The person I'll say if it's a good or bad idea is the customers, not me. Right. Um, and I think, I think for me, I think one of the mindset shifts I, f I tend to find with entrepreneurs, especially, is the fact that they, they've got us, it's, it's very, it's, they're not really, if they put their idea out there, it's not that many people who are actually going to see it. There'll right. be a certain amount of people who will see it, a, a, a data set, but, you know, it's not like, you know, they put a, an idea out there and it, it gets lots of visibility on it and someone's going to steal their idea now that that really depends on who you are as well right now if elon musk came out and, and did a prototype tomorrow everyone would know about it right uh, if i did it no they right. wouldn't be a small amount of people so i think that's another mindset shift as well it's just trying to get entrepreneurs to think okay well no one's actually going to steal my idea right they won't be that and and to be honest they probably won't be that interested straight away yeah and I think that's another mindset shift, which pretty much can help as well. I agree. I agree. It's interesting how you guys mentioned about like, you know, how, you know, because I can definitely relate to, you know, the mindset of, you know, how, 
how tempting it is for like, you know, especially being in a, in, in a position when you're like, you know, building out a new product or service to want to rush. Um, you know, I've seen it quite often. And, um, you know, I've had personal experience with it, you know, when I was building my first startup, you know, I had the constant urge, to, you know, rush through uh, kind of like every single step, because, you know, to me, that felt like progress and progress equals feel good. And then like, if everybody wants to feel good at the end of the day, it's like, let's make as much progress as possible, even if some of that progress may seem misleading and actually slowing down um, and doing things like prototyping would actually help the progress more in the long run, even if you're like slowing down the progress in the initial end. And I think just some of the insights both of you guys made um, are really, were really, really helpful to the listener. Um, Robert, do you want to, um, do you want to uh, take on the next few questions? I was going to ask both everyone, I will ask both of them. Um, either one of you can take this question, but where do you see the most applicable use of prototyping? Um, I mean, I, I'll, I'll start off. I mean, for me, do you mean, do you mean in a, a type of a type of individual or business or do you mean a, a product or a context? So when does pre the, the method or the methodology of prototyping make sense to employ? Well, for me, it's very much, very much at the start. It's very much when the, they've crafted their business idea, either using something like a lean canvas or a business model canvas, and they want to test it early in the market. That's when I would say it's probably the best time to do it. Um, yeah, I, I think for me, that's where it sits. And I think it sits best with, I've not rolled it out with corporate customers yet, only with entrepreneurs. Um, but that's my take is, yeah, very much after the modeling stage of, a potential idea. Um, I think that's when I, I generally use it the most. And do you think prototypes have to take on a sales nature where you're trying to evoke some sort of commerce, in, uh, intention commerce as part of the engagement? Or do you think prototyping can also involve traffic? It can also involve analytics, uh, something where there's intent marketing, but not necessarily trying to find that uh, exchange of, of wealth or not wealth, but, uh, commerce for your idea. Yeah. I mean, yeah, ultimately, yeah, it definitely, I mean, it's, it's like, like, like a lot of the different methodologies out there, you know, prototyping is similar to other methodologies I use like growth marketing. I do a lot of growth marketing work and, you know, growth marketing, growth hacking, uh, whatever you want to call it is, is very much around a similar kind of idea. So it's, it's about using, like you said, Rob, it's about using analytics. It's about experimenting. It's about analyzing and ideating, which is exactly the same as a prototype, really. Just in another word. Um, so, yeah, I see, it, I see it in different contexts. I think it can be used across lots of different, uh, lots of different contests and industries. Saiba, what do you think? Um, I agree with some of all of the stuff Andrew said. And in addition, um, I think prototyping is not just a technique, but it is um, what I'm learning is a way of thinking mm -hmm. and a way of arranging your thoughts <laughs> and a, a way of arranging your perceptive. So in that way, it's being used, it can be used even in daily life, but I definitely think in addition for it being a specific tool is a way of thinking that any stage that you're going into in your um, entrepreneur or idea journey, you can stop at anywhere and prototype at like at the beginning, it's definitely the first place where it starts. But throughout the journey, um, you can prototype if you want to work with this investor. <laughs> you can stop and prototype if you want to do something here. You can stop at any time and insert prototyping techniques to test any little thing that starts to come along as the project grows. You could also prototype your habits. Yes. So if you're thinking about changing the way you do things, whether it's your own to-do list system or it's getting to bed on time, or avoiding the ice cream that's calling your name in the freezer <laughs> on certain days that you don't want it to, you can use that scientific method base to probably apply the same thing. Yes. If I limit my to-do items by seven, then I'll be able to get every 80% of what I want to get done by the end of the day. Yes. And then as you test this out over, over throughout a week, like say give it a week's time, you'll get that your own data concept where you're getting your firsthand impression of how you work, your, if you're cognizant enough, your biases, how you tend to lean one way or another, how you distract yourself. And if you just document how, how it goes, 
start to discover how you can even make minor changes to something that you do professionally or even personally Absolutely. and be able to convey that same kind of change to the business world with clients and understanding that doesn't have to, you don't have to move the ship 90 degrees in a, to the right. You can basically make slight adjustments to either go faster, move in the direction that you eventually want to go in. Sometimes it's that teaching moment that you have to kind of convey when it comes to this methodology. I think I think having a data driven approach as well, I think is like you said, it's, it's it puts you in a good position to, to manage if you have a business or to manage if different clients, if you're a freelancer or, or, or manage your own personal life if you want to go that far. But, um, you know, certainly for me, prototyping, lean startup, growth marketing, all of it, all, it's all data driven. Yeah. Everything sits behind it. If you haven't got data, as, as Alberto says, it's only an opinion. And I think that's really true. Uh, and it does become, it, it's almost like a light switch in your mind, like I said at the start of, 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 of the session, it's very much a light switch and it it does change your mindset and how you actually yeah. think. And on, um, to add to that, and I think one of the reasons why a lot of people that don't connect with prototyping or they have a lot of questions, it, it has a lot to do with habits that we currently have as society, which is, you know, fast moving speed, we don't think through things, et cetera, et cetera. And prototyping and that um, gauging, like you said, um, Robert, like just small steps, paying attention, data-driven decision-making in all aspects of life is something the average person doesn't do. So when you bring something like prototyping to the table, it's so, um, it's so alien to daily behavior and daily practices that it's like, this is too slow for me. <laughs> this, I don't wanna do this and this could be wrong. And, so I definitely see the connection in all aspects of life. And I agree with um, the things that were shared and said. The data driven, yeah, the data driven approach uh, was something that really struck me when I talked to Pierre Delanois, who's the senior manager of HR product development at, at Shurian. Uh, when we had, I had a podcast with him before, but what was really memorable about all of that is how he used quick wins with his teams at a project level using metrics, like leveraging metrics as an operational process, uh, basically with backlog service offerings, ever having the end user focus, using uh, lean startup methodology, uh, design thinking, design sprints, but essentially constant testing. Mm -hmm. But when he, when he finally found something that worked in terms of process, he basically showed the analytics, he showed the data and showed how it was moving the business needle in a meaningful way, for both um, in terms of market share, revenue, market impact, basically. And that's the kind of conversation that does that kind of moves things forward over time. Because he started in 2017. And when I talked to him back in 2020, early 2020, that's what it took like three years for him to get there. But that was a perfect example of how you use data to yeah. change the the, yeah. the trajectory of where a company could go in terms of its advancement and innovation. Yeah, it, and, you know, that, that's one of the things it, it's, you know, I think there's a stat out there that I think the average company runs less than 10 tests a month uh, of different growth tactics or different product innovations or, you know, whereas some companies like Google, okay, the scale wasn't much bigger at scale and Facebook, they're running hundreds and hundreds of tests a week right. on different yeah. parts of their business. And what, what experiments do, as we all know, experiments gives you more opportunity to learn. And if you're doing that, you know, you're going to learn a lot quicker. And I think that's one of the, the mindset shifts, which it takes, I think, people who have never implemented a prototype or never got involved in prototypes I think that's one of the, the, the difficulties they have. They have to see that, and that's why we mentioned judo strategy earlier. They have to see that this has a benefit and it will change their mindset. And the only way to do that is to show them through proof, I, I found. So what prototypes are both of you doing this year? What are you planning on working on and experimenting with in, the, say, the first quarter of this year? Um, for business-wise or with clients or how, how do you want me to... In general, um, at the minute, I haven't got any actually going. At the minute, I have my last one finished with a client last week, um, so I ran one last week, which was the landing page uh, test, um, where we got the results back, and you know, it is what it is. Um, 
there is i have a, i have potential another client who i'm working with who's looking to do pop-up pop-up type stalls um in a disused a disused shopping center to see if something which is strange at the minute because of what's going on but um you know that is really another one which should be coming up in the next few weeks hopefully and we'll start looking at that as far as my own my own business i've got like I said, I in my own business, I'm running, I run probably maybe 10 experiments a week on what I'm doing now. And part of that is pre-types. It could be for me, it could be landing pages. It could be a new type of brochure up out there to see what feedback I get. Um, and lots of different ways of doing it. So that's really my, over the next few weeks, I don't normally think further ahead than two or three weeks. Um, for me in, um, in, general um validating my own personal ideas and thoughts and just prototyping as much ideas as i have i used to think my strength was um ideation <laughs> and coming up with ideas but as prototyping has taught us that's not really a strength or something skill based so now i'm just practicing um I, i'm calling it pim my pim stage prototyping in motion just practicing taking on my ideas whether they're apps or consumer ideas and testing them out. Uh, from a learning perspective, I'm definitely trying to, I've been engaging with uh, different companies and organizations to introduce prototyping. So I'm prototyping, prototyping <laughs> and how people are responding, responding to that. Um, and that's it, that's gonna be it. I almost think that there should be, if you're really into social media, it's a good platform to kind of use as like a, a short form kind of video thing. Yeah. where the very beginning of it is, is basically your XYZ. You just basically go, if I walk up to this person and ask him for a donut, he's going to give me a donut or whatever. Right. Just the, the hypothetically, but it could be something where you showcase how you have an experimental nature so yes. that if people want to find you offline. Yes, yes. I, see I what I you're all you about. Agree. Thank yeah. you. I totally agree. And I forgot to mention, I am, um, I've been doing some filming for a YouTube channel and, you know, I want to do crazy and creative stuff like that and just, like we've been saying, just shift things to becoming testing to be more normal. You know, mm -hmm. be your first, your go-to thing right away. As I look back um, over my year, years of experience and working with people and providing A plus services, we hardly tested. Like <laughs> I took their word and their market research for it and give or take, oh, this makes sense, this doesn't. And I, I, um, I did a lot of um, professional things that now I see that it wasn't, it was the best of what I knew, but now I know there's definitely better. So I'm definitely finding more ways uh, to get the behavior of testing to become very normal and very normal, more testing, more testing is the first thing you do and just it becoming a normal thing to do. Yeah. I think What's another trend? Go ahead. No, I was going to say, I think you said about, you know, trying to get companies and try to get more experimentation out there. And that's one of the problems, I think. I think you know we find certainly in the UK we find you know it, the the ethos of testing is not really there unless you're in the IT space right um, and we tend to find that quite a lot that I you know there's a number of different ways of seeing it I usually find with corporates they don't want to get involved in testing straight away they'd rather roll it out because they've got deadlines to hit as far as testing and deliver sorry delivering their product and then they put it into the sales team and then the sales team have to then sell it. So that is for example, from example, a sales process right. product. And then another thing I always find with entrepreneurs, I don't always find with entrepreneurs, but something I've seen with entrepreneurs is when, when you pre a type, it gives you a, it generally gives you a very solid answer. If something has actually worked or it hasn't, it's fairly black and white. And what I tend to find with some entrepreneurs is they, they almost practice um, innovation theatre. Yep. <laughs> so it's very much about okay. So I don't want to test it because what what if no one likes it? Right. What right. if no one wants this? And then what I'm going to have is I'm going to have my dreams shattered. Yep. And, and this is I, I see that quite a lot. Yep. And that's you know that's what to be fair that's one of the most that's one of the things that really stood out for me of coaching teams is that is, is very much convincing themselves, you know, and the, the local, their friends or their family say, that, yeah, this is a fantastic idea, but we all know that is not the greatest data source. And I think that's, that's a big one. And that, that takes, that 
bias in someone's mind takes a lot to break through as well and it takes a lot for that individual to say okay i'm going to accept this now and i am going to move forward with what i'm doing so um yeah that's that's exactly what i've seen a few times it's also the political liability of the moment because some will want that information that that innovation theater to be something that they can put there without people understanding context without it having to be proven what the idea is is that even if it goes to complete goes to the doghouse um, that it doesn't really matter because the idea is, is that it's still a talking point for them in some aspects in their in their career I've seen it a lot in enterprise environments and you're correct testing isn't that valued outside of it validating the existing work that's part of a production pipeline and it's really hard to break but the the stakes are different when you have leadership kind of vying for um, you know some sort of validation from their people that they answer to as well as to keep the numbers going because stability is what enterprise environments crave so testing or experimenting and then actually showcasing what's not working is usually not as palpable as it would be on a, on a smaller scale. That's it. And I think, you know, again, you know, I, I'm not sure what it's like in the States and in Canada, but in the UK, you know, we don't have a, a huge culture of pre-typing or lean startup. You know, lean startup is, is known, but it's not known that well. And whereas in the States, I've speak to a lot of people in the States and they, most people know, know that methodology and how it works and how pre-typing can work with that. So this whole way of developing a product and using things like prototyping is still quite alien you know so much so you know i've been working with some universities and i've been talking to them about prototyping but you know th these guys run incubators and and everything else and they're very good at what they do but prototyping is not on the radar it's not been heard of mm -hmm. um and yeah and you know and when you do explain it and you say well, this is how it works and it's like, oh, again, the light bulb moment. This this might actually really work. Um, you know, and I think I think that's the thing. So it's, I think that just takes time again. I think that, that shift of mindset just takes time. And I think um it'll as you know, more and more things like this come about and more exposure to prototyping as a as a, a community, I think we'll probably see more and more, hopefully, movement on it. Jonathan, what are your thoughts? Um yeah, I think, you know, a lot of the stuff that, you know, Andrew mentioned, you know, makes sense, you know, especially, you know, um, within with regards to, you know, like kind of what's going on in the UK startup space. I mean, there's like kind of like um, there's like a general consensus theory that like I think the UK sometimes can be like slower to be to pick up on like, you know, newer uh, methodologies. So, for example, like when Lean Startup was invented in like, for example, 2012, around that time. Right. Um mm -hmm. I didn't really see Lean Startup become as popular in the UK, uh, or at least around the London area until like maybe to 2018, 2019. I don't know if I'm getting the dates around right. Um, and then, um, and then subsequently, you know, when I uh, when I first came over like about four months ago, and I started, you know, doing a lot of you know prototyping evangelization for like 99% of the people, they're like, oh wow, what's prototyping? You know, what's this and this and this? It's like. In some ways, it feels cool because it's like you're the only person really talking about this 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 fringe ideology that like came out out of Silicon Valley and was expanded to Australia. But it's on another hand, it's like, you know, it's almost like it's disappointing to see a lot of early stage entrepreneurs, you know, not not go for like kind of like an experimental kind of mindset towards building their companies and instead kind of tacking on the good old fashioned, all right. Head, heads down, build an MVP and let's get it and let's kind of like ship it out as fast as possible. Um, so I think for me, you know, I'd love to, uh, and something I'm very, very, Andrew and I are both very committed to is that to, to try to pre evangelize prototyping as much as possible in and around the UK um, in the hopes of, you know, um, of, of encouraging aspiring entrepreneurs to get on, get on the right mindset to, um, to, to grow successful companies. I mean, this is good. This is what's going to be needed in this upcoming year, you know, um, especially, you know, within a challenging economic climate. Um, and specifically for us, we got a big old thing called Brexit that just happened. And, you know, a lot of people are going to be out of jobs. So a lot of people are going to need to learn how to build up successful companies um, in order to survive in this present day economy. Yeah, I think, I think another thing to think about as well is, 
you know, in the UK, certainly, you know, again, I'm not sure it's like other countries, but the ecosystem of, of you know, the, the system in the UK is, is still quite traditional when it comes to business planning and business yeah. startups and how to do it, you know, and, you know, like, any, like anyone, you know, you could set, you could apply to set a business up in the UK and you go to a bank and they'll ask you to fill out 20 slides or 20 pages or something and a spread, you know, a spreadsheet to, to talk about where your business is going to go. But, you know, as we all know, that's all make-believe in Thoughtland. And, you know, I think that that culture as well certainly needs to change. And again, it's slowly changing now with various accelerators in the UK who are actually now implementing more modern practices. But like Jonathan said, you know, we can't, as a, as a nation, the UK or well, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a globe, really, we can't hang around anymore. You know, we've, we can't be spending years and years trying to build a product and then it fails. It's too costly and there's too many being delivered, now, too many being developed now. We just need to get it out there, get it tested and then start dropping it into the development process in, in time. Absolutely. Um, um, with that being said, guys, let's um, head off to the last segment of our um, of our um, of our podcast, which is called "Design That Prototype." Um, so we're going to give you uh, uh, Andrew and Cybo. We're going to give you guys an existing product or service, and uh, and I'm just going to and I'm curious to hear you guys' thoughts on you know how you would prototype it. So the first okay. thing, so the first product I'll give you guys is Amazon Go. Okay, so the Amazon Go, the food, the food, food arm, yeah, mm, yeah, the delivery arm. So how would I prototype that? Um, okay, so are we talking the whole prototype of the whole process, or are we just talking about the delivery function or the complete everything? So someone orders it, and someone gets it delivered. The quick, the quick implementation. So like just a one sentence implementation, like how you would prototype it. Um, I mean, you could do it. You could. How could we do this? One way you could do it, I suppose, you could set up a very simple, um, very simple page, which is connected to WhatsApp, as an example. Sends the order through to WhatsApp, then that person, i.e., me, jumps in my car, drives to a place, shops, delivers it to that person's local address. Um, that could be one. Or I could be the middle person on that. So I could have, again, drive traffic somehow to so a page or to another way of doing it. And then I could be the middle person. I could do like a Wizard of Oz type, pretty type, because I could actually be in the middle. They think it's automated, but really I'm, I'm the, the computer. And then I can manually trade it off to someone else. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, again, that's off the fly, but I'm just thinking... Yeah, that's, it's really just, for me, it's about pretending that, you know, the customer needs to think it's very much automated behind the scenes. Um, and I could actually be that computer. So, yeah. Um, I honestly, I'm going to, I like what you said, and I'm going to leverage off one of the things you said. Is that cheating? <laughs> I like that okay. you, because um, I, I like to test immediately with what I have. And one of the things you said that stood up to me is like something like a WhatsApp group. So I may start off wanting to test the concept more than um, the whole platform. So I might create a WhatsApp group where people can um, post their what they want and then other people can post when they're on the road. So we can test like what lists people have uh, versus people that are on the road and are able to grab that and drop them off. So just leveraging off something that you mentioned around WhatsApp groups and just leveraging off the idea of picking up things and dropping it off as it's convenient for people within a given space, I would do something like that. So kind of cheating, but yeah, I like that idea. <laughs> I will prototype how convenient it is to work with a small group of people, with um, people that have list of things that they want and people that are in motion to get those things and how that can work with a small group of people. In a small area, you know, a very a small, small provincial type, pre type, you could do it in a small area, couldn't you? Right. Like I have six sisters and we have a WhatsApp group. So if I had to really test this immediately, I'll say, guys, um, who's going out? This is my list. During the week, grab me this and drop it off. It's something like that to see how the flow of sharing what you want and who responds and how they're responding is something that I would do. Yeah. 
Um, the next one is a book on prototyping. Do <laughs> um, you want to go first? I'll go first, yeah. Um, a book on prototyping. I... Now, wait a minute. Do I get a chance to actually do the Amazon Go or are we just having um, uh, Andrew and, and Seibel kind of giving their things yeah. on, the, on the book? Go for it, dude. Well, how would you prototype Amazon Go? So I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna engage this from the prototyping standard. I'm gonna give you my market engagement hypothesis, and then I'm gonna give you an X Y Z, so that I kind of like I kind of give you a story before I give the engagement. So with Amazon Go, uh, my thinking is that people usually are impulse buying when they go there, but to Stiebel's point, there could be a group of people that want to get something done. Like say there's a there's a potluck or some sort of event, like there's a birthday or whatever, and there's certain things that need to be got or whatever it is. So if, the, if there was this existence of a list that was native to Amazon Go, uh, when somebody walks into the store and, and Prime identifies them through the wireless, like basically it's like you're, you're, you're now you're shopping, then there's little LED lights that are basically in certain sections that correspond to particular products. So literally you're just walking around and finding those particular LEDs where they're lit, and then you can easily get what you want and get out of the door much faster. So my, my market engagement hypothesis is that if users had, if users had a, a Amazon Go shopping list to curate and use, they would ease better, they would more easily find products within the store. So the idea is, is that um, if 10% of people, if 10% of customers in the United Kingdom download the, or yeah, download the Amazon Amazon Go list app. That traffic and traffic would increase by ten percent, and purchases of certain sundries would increase by twenty percent. Though I would probably have to look at the data or be in the Amazon be in an Amazon store to figure that out. That's it. So, on to the book idea. Okay, I like that. Uh, what you said. Um, for a book on pedal type, I would say, um, and I'm gonna follow with the XYZ hypothesis that you just brought back to the table. 10% um, of entrepreneurs complaining in a WhatsApp group will click, thinking precisely is hard, you know. <laughs> well, 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 take a step back and do the market engagement hypothesis. Kind of talk to, you, talk to yourself about the story that you're trying to tell around the engagement that you're thinking about. I think once okay. you have those pieces, you can kind of start building out something. Okay. So, um, hmm. And if you want to, you can pass. You can pass the. You can pass the ball to Andrew because I know he's a very smart man. He can probably <laughs> like. He can probably give you some like bandwidth to kind of think about which which direction you want to go in. Okay, I'll give myself ten more, two more seconds. If I don't come up with anything, I'll pass it on. Um, and time. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I've actually, okay, okay, Andrew, go ahead. I've actually done this recently. So um, I, I basically, you know, I, I've tried to become, you know, people can see me on social media, you know, a bit more now and I'm, you know, trying to get, get my presence up on social media. And one of the things I did was I, I thought about writing a book, but I thought, is it going to actually, would actually anyone actually buy it? Would anyone be interested in it? So I, I, developed a um, landing page. I took a nice, I developed a mock-up of the front cover. I listed out the contents of the book and I stuck on a landing page and I drove traffic to it to see, and my website as well had the picture of the book. And I did it and I wanted my, my, my analysis was that the average conversion rate, opt-in rate on websites is between five and 15%. So I went for a very, very conservative estimate and said, look, 10% of people click yes, interested. Then that gives me a, you know, gives me something to work on. So anyway, so what happened was that I got 11%, I think, opt-ins in, in the end. So it's fairly high. But on the back of that, like you just said about the, the group and asking people about, you know, the common problems. I actually put it out there to some of the teams I work with as well. And I asked, you know, I said, I, I've just advertised the book. And mm. I actually then people came to me and said, oh, have you got a copy of the book? Can I, can I get a copy? Can I oh, buy that's it? Awesome. Which 
was quite I was quite strange because I haven't actually oh I've actually started writing it now, but my plan was never to write it if no one was actually interested in actually reading it. And that's how I did it. You know, and, and my conversion rate, okay, I can't remember the XY XYZ I'll pop it off the top of my head, but it was very much about I had to hit the ballpark of a conversion rate on a website and then I also had to get some quality feedback as well, which is what I did. So so that's how I that's how I tested it recently. And um yeah, that's that's how I've done it. And the book should be out in about April, May. So can it be pre can it be pre ordered on Amazon? No, not yet. Not yet. It will be though. It will be coming out. It's, when I say April, May, it's probably going to be more likely June, June, August, July, August. Mm-hmm. Um, very uh, optimistic in that. But it's yeah, it's almost three quarters way through now. So, so there you go. That that's how I tested it. Um, very cool. It out. I was going to say the exact same thing. <laughs> I'm just joking, <laughs> but that was great. <laughs> Cybal, do you have anything to, that you want to kind of put up there for the pre-typing book? No, I, I, uh, <clears throat> not really. I think I like um, my approaches for testing that I'm finding that it's kind of like my thing is um, trying to get a, a, like real contact with people as close as possible. That's something that I like to do. So that's what I was kind of heading towards. Like, where are people now? Where are the conversations happening? And how could I be a part of that conversation leading to something like what Andrew discussed? So my go-to behavior somehow is about getting in touch as close as possible with the potential audience. So um, I will prototype by maybe putting a flyer up in a Facebook group where people are complaining (laughs) about ideas or um, becoming entrepreneurs or signing up for anything that's in that landscape, I'll prototype by jumping right in there and seeing and advertising the possibility of a book that teaches you how not to fail. You could also, um, you could also use like the infiltrator type, prototype. Right. You could, you know, you could combine it with provincial potentially. You could say, okay, so I'm going to design a nice front cover on, on uh, Canva. I'm going to then print it off, I'm going to then stick it around an existing book and I'm going to speak to a bookshop and, I, and see how many people actually pick it up and use a local bookstop in your lo- bookshop in your local town um, and then gauge, you know, 100 people go into the shop and how many actually people potentially who go to the section pick it up. And again, that's, an, that's, a, that's a bit of a low tech way of doing it, but, you know, that would probably work in a local environment or a university or a library or somewhere like that. I like that. I like that. And maybe to leverage off that, maybe do um, a YouTube vi- to video where I'm um, reviewing a book <laughs> that helped me become a great uh, product developer or whatever. And that book is a fake book <laughs> and seeing how many people ask for the name of the book based on me giving this review of this great book that doesn't exist. So, yeah, yeah, definitely. I wonder what a constable a prototype would look like. If we actually had our, our own custom prototypes, but it, it was a particular uh, way of us experimenting. If we just put our last name to a prototype name, what exactly would that be? Oh God. So explain that again. Sorry, Rob, that confused me. Later. So you, ha- you have like things like the, the, fall, the fake door, you have the infiltrator, uh, you have uh, the morsel. So you have different ones, but what would be a constable prototype? If you were to take your last name and kind of put it to a prototype, what kind of prototype would it be? Oh, God. <laughs> um, that's interesting. Yeah, that's an interesting one. That's a, that's a bit of a teaser. That's a, um, I don't know. You go first. You go first. Sorry, go on. You go first, Rob. What would yours be? Uh, my, my would be all about uh, improving your sleep. So if it was the scrub prototype, it would be about uh, maximizing your, actually, that would be a Lee Duncan one because Lee Duncan is a fanatic about sleep. I'm not. Um, I would have to think about something that I'm, that I can key in on that's basically all about me and make that my prototype experiment type, but put it in a sort of context. So if I was really into muffin baking, then it would be a muffin prototype, but it would be just called the scrub prototype because it would be suited for a particular type of, um, a product or context. 
it mine would probably be something to do with probably if I was going to prototype something for myself, it would probably be something to do with fitness, uh, some sort of fitness exercise, especially with being, you know, working remotely as everyone is at the minute, you know, you're supposed to go out and do exercise, but it's, but it's freezing cold outside and, you know, but then when you do go out, you feel a lot better because, you know, you're getting exposure to the sunlight or the light anyway. And maybe that would be something I would, you know, look at, maybe try and measure it was very, very difficult to measure it potentially, but that's how I would uh, maybe use it if it was on myself. It could be a way of marketing your professional brand as well. If you were able to maybe not necessarily put your last name there, but maybe put your, your business name or something that where it has some, some recognition by your audience and say, this is this prototype and this is what it does because then you people are, people already know the brand, but now they're attracted to the concept or the methodology that would be one of those ways of introducing something that isn't well known into the zeitgeist of understanding what the what experimentation is all about. Yeah, completely, completely. All right, Jonathan, where are we going from here? Um, I personally don't have any more. I personally don't have any more um, questions unless we want to like uh, extend it out and say like if we were to make a pre type on ourselves, um, I would um what's something i'm passionate about um i think uh I'll, I'll, I'll give something like really really cheesy i mean i'm a young single man in his early 20s so i think like um uh, when when lockdown gets out i think i'll i'll, I'll, I'll run like some sort of silly prototype and say like if if i go to this social event at least 15 percent of the girls at the social event will Woo! give me their number and uh you know just kind of run that run that prototype on myself and uh <laughs> Hopefully it goes well. <laughs> Rob, I don't know about you, but that's that feels like a long time ago for me. Yeah, I was going to say, that's the JSON prototype for sure. <laughs> it's like, how can you maximize your dating potential? <laughs> yeah, that, that would definitely be something uh, I would I think would spark interest, especially with everybody. You know, I'm vaccinated. You know, it's, 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 the, it's, it's the new clearance, like... Uh, you know, you no longer have a disease, but not that type of disease, the one that everybody else has, yeah. but you're clear and now you're available. Exactly. Just follow Jason's prototype for maximizing your potential mates. Exactly. <laughs> well, I think, I think you should do it. And I think you should do it right after you get vaccinated and put it out there <laughs> and, uh, and just make sure that your marketing is full of very rainbow bright colors and Bauhaus type fonts very blocky and i think uh it would be a very interesting prototype to see what happens definitely we'll do. Uh, TikTok. stick on tiktok yes put it on tiktok <laughs> make a lot lots of blinking winking screens and you definitely won't go far <laughs> got it do either of you have anything coming up that you want to plug that we should put into the to the mix of us kind of showcasing the both of you for the podcast in like say february or march i have an uh, yeah i have an event on the uh, 28th of January, uh, where I'm doing a growth marketing uh, webinar for innovation professionals. That's on LinkedIn at the minute. So uh, it's free, it's a free event. So people want to go to our page and then uh, Growth Tribe, uh, go to that and uh, it's there. I am launching my first uh, YouTube video, possibly the end of January, early February, around prototyping and shifting and all that that we've been talking about. And if people want to find out more about you online, where should they go? Uh, for me, LinkedIn and um, yeah, LinkedIn. Right yeah, now. LinkedIn for me. I'm, I'm, I'm on most platforms, but LinkedIn is my most, uh, the one I'm on there the most. And if you want to find them on LinkedIn, you want to search for Andrew Constable, that's C-O-N-S-T-A-B-L-E. And Cybel is Cybel, exactly how it sounds. You don't have to guess on me. No, it's S A I B E L L E. And her last name is K H A I B A H. You can find both of them, connect with them, or you leave a message if you want to continue a conversation based on what you've been hearing in today's podcast. Thank you guys for listening to our prototyping podcast. Um, we'll have more episodes coming out soon. So stay tuned. And remember, fail fast, McDonald's cheap. <laughs> And disease-free. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs>